welcome back to this my 11th update on the COVID crisis. I'll make a confession. I never thought when I started these updates on February 26th that I'd still be doing them, but I'm going to follow a familiar template. As in the previous crises, I'm going to start by listing out how it's played out in the last couple of weeks and give you an update on where markets stand across regions, across sectors, across industries, but then use the crisis to see if I can see some commonalities. Basically, I'm going to argue that there is a word that keeps coming up as I look at the winners and losers from this crisis, and that word is flexibility. Now, I'm sure you're bemused. What does flexibility have to do with markets? But I'll come back and flesh out that concept in today's session. So let's start with the update. Let's start as I have in the previous updates by looking at a selected list of equity indices around the world. I've broken them down by region and all of the indices tell pretty much the same story of a market in two phases. But in February 14th and March 20th, this was a market that was down, down and still down. And you see that across the world. Since March 20th, though, you've seen a recovery, more in some markets than others, but I'll come back and talk more about equities across regions and sectors. But my point that this is a crisis that's played out in two acts. The first act being, being a pretty depressing act of markets being down, February 14th and March through March 20th, and a second act where markets have been on the upswing since March 20th plays out in market after market. Like where? If you look at the treasury market, you see the drop in treasury rates, US treasury rates across the board, three month, two year, 10 year, 30 year, across the board, you see the rates drop in the first few weeks of the crisis. And then they settle in. I know there are many who believe that it's a Fed driven market and the Fed has had an effect, don't get me wrong, but much of the drop in rates happened before the first announcement from the Fed on March 15th and the subsequent announcement in March 23rd about quantitative easing. There is something the Fed did, though, on March 23rd that I think played a role in turning this market around, and that is agreeing or, or announcing that there were going to be a backstop in corporate lending markets, corporate bond and corporate borrowing markets. Now, actually, the Fed hasn't actually had to go through with much of what they announced they would do because private lending markets seem to pick up right after the Fed announced that it was going to be a backstop. Where does this show up? If you look at the corporate bond market, you look at default spreads. Default spreads between February 14th and March 20th widened dramatically. For example, the default spread on triple B rated corporate bonds almost tripled between February 14th and March 20th in five weeks. Since March 20th, uh, since March 20th though, you can see that default spreads have been on their way down. They're still higher than they were before the crisis, but they're way below where they were at their peak. So price of risk in the bond market has clearly dropped off. Now, as the corporate bond price of risk has dropped, so has the price of risk in the equity market. I won't bore you with the details, but many of you know that I track the price of risk in the equity market with what I call an implied equity risk premium. I back it out of what stock prices are and expected cash flows, and it tells a story. A story very similar to the story that you saw in the corporate bond market. Between February 14th and March 20th, the price of risk in equity markets, the equity risk premium rose fairly dramatically. It went from about 4.8% to seven, almost 8% by March 23rd. That was their peak. And since then, it's been on a downward trend. By June 26th, the equity risk premium for, a, you know, in, at least for the S&P 500 was back down to 5.23%, higher than it was before the crisis, but way below its peak. Now, that equity risk premium 5.23% is not a bad number. It's, in fact, higher than the historic norm. But there is one disconcerting factor that you need to keep in mind. If you think about the equity risk premium of 4.83% on February 14th, it was on top of a T-bond rate of 1.59%. You add those two numbers up, you come up with an expected return on stocks on February 14th of 6.42%. That's what you could have expected to earn on stocks in the long term. That number was already down from the historic norms of seven and a half or eight percent. Now, if you look at June 26, the equity risk premium is 5.23 percent. It's on top of a risk free rate of 0.66 percent. You add those two numbers together, the expected return on stocks on March 20, uh, on June 26 is 5.89 percent. Now, if I'd offered you 5.89% on stocks in 2007, you'd have pushed me away. Why? Because you could have made a T-bond rate of 4% plus. Today, with T-bond rates of 
That equity return doesn't look great, but it looks great relative to the alternatives. I'll let you ponder the implications of that because I want to also talk about what commodities have done during this crisis. And I'm going to focus on two commodities that I've been tracking for this entire period, copper and oil, both economically sensitive. Copper prices are now back to more to, to where they were on February 14 plus an extra four or five percent. So if you're looking at the copper market, it seems to be saying what global economic showdown. But we look at oil, very different story. They were down more than 50% at the very bottom of this crisis. They made their way back, but they're still down about 30%, both Brent crude and West Texas crude. Now, if you look at gold and Bitcoin, and I paired them for a simple reason. Gold, of course, is a classic crisis asset. It's the investment that people make when they don't trust markets. And I've tracked gold, and it's done reasonably well during this crisis. It's up about 9%. While that might disappoint gold bugs, it's done reasonably well. Bitcoin, I've paired with gold because at least in the eyes of some advocates, it is what people will flee to when they don't trust central banks and they don't trust currencies. Well, that might still be true in the future, but it's clearly not been true in this crisis because Bitcoin has behaved not just like equities, it's behaved like very risky equities. Down more than 50% at the bottom of this crisis on March 23rd, it's recouped some of that loss. It's still down 19%, but it's behaving like a risky equity. That has to be factored in if you think about investing in Bitcoin as a crisis asset. Now, with that set up, let's talk a little bit about how equities are behaved across different groupings. As you know, I collect individual market cap, company, uh, market cap data on, on companies for every publicly traded company globally. Sounds more complicated and difficult than it really is with today's access to data. And then I slice and dice the data. Slice down by region, here's what I see. I look at returns broken down by sub-regions of the world, and you might not like the way I break them down, but I pretty much got the globe broken down by region. If you look at the last, uh, at, the, at the fourth from the, I'm sorry, the fifth from the last column, you see the percentage change in aggregate market cap by region. The most affected uh, regions of the world, if you look at the total damage done between February 14th and June 26th, are mostly emerging markets, Africa, Latin America. The, you know, the, the only developed market that, that kind of ranks up there at the big, big loss is the UK. Emerging markets have been more affected than developed markets and Asia has been less affected than other emerging markets. You see, what are those last four columns? While I compute the percentage change in our aggregate market cap, I also look at the individual company data. What does that tell you? By looking at the individual company data, you can see whether the, the change has been broad based or narrow. For instance, if you look at every part of the world, you notice that more stocks have dropped than increased in every part of the world. In fact, globally, almost 70% of companies percent of companies are reporting a drop in, mar in market cap since the start of the crisis. What that captures again is whether individual companies are telling a different story than the aggregate data. So browse it, see what you can gl glean from looking at that comparison. I also looked at equities broken down by sector. Here again, if you look at the fifth from the last column, you see the percentage uh, market change in market cap, in aggregate market cap by sector. The best performing sector is healthcare. No surprises there since this is a viral crisis. But if you look at consumer products, both um, discretionary and uh, both uh, staples and discretionary, you see they've held up pretty well. Technology has held up well. The worst affected sectors have been the big infrastructure businesses. And we'll come back and talk about perhaps what ties them together. But you can see that it's those sectors where you see damages still in the double digits. But in every single sector, you see that the worst of the damage was done in February 14th and March 20th. If you break down by industry and you look at the worst hit and the best performing industries, you see again a confirmation of what we saw at the sector level. The best performing industries have been light cap, capital light businesses, technology, and a, and, a, and, a, and a combination of healthcare businesses. The worst affected businesses tend to be infrastructure businesses and financial services. I forgot to mention this when I looked at the sectors, but the worst performing sector 
across all the sectors is not energy, it's not airlines, it is financial services. Why? Banks live in reflected pain and reflected glory, an expression I've used before. And if energy companies and airlines fail to make their loans, guess who ends up holding the bag? And if you look at the big losers, they tend to be infrastructure and financial services. Now, here's where I want to kind of look, step back from the market action and look to see if there are any commonalities. In my posts across the, the last few weeks, I've highlighted in each post a grouping of companies that I think have been hurt more than other companies. So early in my post on March 23rd, I, I pointed to the fact that companies with higher debt loads were being hurt more than companies with lighter debt loads. Later on May 13th, I looked at growth stocks versus value stocks and I pinpointed the fact that growth stocks seem to be holding up their value much better than value stocks. Growth stocks being high P, high price to book and value stocks being low P and low price to book. Then in two updates ago, or, or in my last update, I actually looked at companies across the life cycle and noted that young companies have done much better than older companies in this particular crisis. Along the way, others have pointed out that capital intensive businesses seem to be getting hurt more than capital light businesses. Very early in the crisis, people pointed the finger at buybacks and said companies doing buybacks were being hurt more than companies not doing buybacks, though the evidence they offered was primarily anecdotal, airlines and Boeing. And the buzzword among consultants seems to be resilient, that resilient companies are doing better than crisis. Now, to be quite honest, I don't quite understand what resilient means other than they can take a punch and keep going. I think the word that does better at capturing all of these disparate trends is flexibility. When you think about flexibility in businesses, flexibility can take on many dimensions. And in fact, I'm going to argue that when you think about flexibility in a company, it can come in, in many different disguises. The first is investment flexibility. Investment flexibility measures how much you need to invest to get a given level of growth and how long you have to wait. The more you have to invest to get a given growth and the longer you have to wait, the less investment flexibility you have. So as examples, you can point to heavy infrastructure companies, toll road companies, telecom companies, obviously big investment up front, you've got to wait a long time before the payoff. I know some of you will then jump to the make a leap and say, well, that must mean tangible companies that have to make tangible investments will, be, will have lower flexibility than intangibles. That's not quite true. Pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies, I would argue, have low investment flexibility, even though they invest in intangible assets. Why? Because their R&D happens up front and it's a big number and you've got to wait a long time. Companies with high investment flexibility don't need to invest as much and they get the payoff much more quickly. Examples would be service and consulting businesses, software businesses, and the sharing economy companies that we've seen pop up over the last decade. One of the features of the Ubers and the Airbnbs of the world is they can scale up quickly. That's what investment flexibility allows you to do because they have capital light models. So that's investment flexibility. It's, let's see how investment flexibility has played out during this crisis. To measure investment flexibility, I'm going to use a ratio, a ratio of revenues to invested capital. You see, what does that measure? It measures for every dollar of investment I make, how many dollars of revenues I get. So more investment flexibility you have, the higher the sales to capital ratio should be. Now, of course, there are flaws in which in measuring invested capital because it comes from the balance sheet. And I accept all those flaws, but it's still a proxy for investment flexibility. So I break down global companies based on sales to capital ratio. Remember, the companies with the lowest sales to capital have the least investment flexibility and the companies with the highest sales to capital have the most investment flexibility. Take a look at the last column. It gives you how the market has treated these companies. The companies with the lowest investment flexibility have been punished more than the companies with the highest investment flexibility. In fact, at the highest end of the spectrum, stocks have actually gone up. So clearly in this crisis, at least, companies with more investment flexibility have been rewarded relative to companies with less investment flexibility. Second measure of flexibility is operating flexibility. What am I capturing here? When you have a revenue shock at a company, your revenues pop up or they drop down. Operating flexibility measures how much your operating income is affected by a given change in revenues. The biggest driver of this is your cost structure. 
If you're a company with a lot of fixed costs, a given shock in revenues is going to translate into a much bigger effect on your operating income. Why? Because everything flows into your operating income. So if revenues drop, your operating income is going to implode and you're going to have operating losses. And if revenues go up, your operating income is going to pop up dramatically. So when you have lots of fixed costs, you have low operating flexibility. When you have very few fixed costs, you have high operating flexibility. So when you think about operating flexibility, it shows up as how much your operating income changes for a given change in revenues. Good examples of companies with very low operating flexibility are tend to be an airline. It's a classic example of, of a business with very low operating flexibility. Almost all of your costs are fixed. So even if your airlines are completely grounded, not a single flight is taking off, you still have those costs. Many industrial companies, especially those built in the last century, have very little operating flexibility. And you could argue that brick and mortar retail firms, even if you shut the stores down, have big fixed costs because they still have to pay those leases, low operating flexibility. In contrast, companies high operating flexibility have mostly variable costs. So when revenues drop, they suffer, but not by as much because their costs also decrease. So temporary staffing companies, for instance, have low fixed costs, high variable costs. Online retailing is clear benefit over brick and mortar retailing. Companies with high operating flexibility will have operating income change much less for any given change in revenue. So let's see how COVID has played out with these companies. And here I have to make a confession. Measuring operating flexibility is really difficult to do because if you could, you'd like to measure how much of the cost in a company are fixed and how much are variable. Unfortunately, accounting doesn't do a very good job with that. So I'm going to use a proxy and you might agree or disagree with this proxy. I'm going to argue that companies with high gross margin, gross income measures the income left over after just your cost of goods sold. Companies with high gross margins have far more flexibility than companies with low gross margin. Because if you have high gross margin, you have the freedom. Even if revenues drop, you, you can adjust fairly quickly. So let's see how this plays out in terms of how the market has treated these companies. Companies with the highest gross margins have done much better than companies with the lowest gross margins. Again, this is not conclusive. Gross margin is a very rough measure of operating flexibility. But companies with high gross margin, and I'm assuming they have high flexibility, have done much better than companies with low operating flexibility. So there's investment flexibility, there's operating flexibility. Let's talk about financing flexibility. What does that measure? Remember we said when there's a shock to revenues, there's a shock to your operating income, your operating income can drop if your revenues drop. Financing flexibility measures how for a given change in operating income, how much your net income changes. And what drives that? Two big decisions you make as a company. How much debt you choose to take on and how much cash you hold on to. The more debt you have, the bigger the interest expense you have. So that makes your financing flexibility lower. And the more cash you have, the more interest income you have, which kind of buffers the pain of having decreased operating income. Companies with a lot of debt and very little cash have low financing flexibility. What does that mean? A given change in your operating income will translate into a much bigger effect in your net income. So companies which have very high debt and very low cash balances will have low, op low financing flexibility. In contrast, if you're a company with very little debt and a lot of cash, you have lots of financing flexibility. Let's see how this has played out with COVID. Again, what I've done here is taken a direct measure of, of how much financing flexibility you have by using the net debt that you have as a company scaled to your EBITDA, the total cash you have. The companies with the lowest net debt to EBITDA have the least financial, I'm sorry, have the most financial flexibility and they've done much better than the companies with the highest net debt, debt to EBITDA, which have the least financial flexibility. In fact, companies with negative EBITDA have even less flexibility and they've done badly as well. So again, financial companies with high financing flexibility seem to be being treated better by the market. Finally, let's look at cash return flexibility. What does that measure? Well, remember, revenues, a shock to revenues drops your operating income that, and operating flexibility measures that. A drop in operating income shows up as lower net income or even as net losses. Financing flexibility captures that. 
Cash return flexibility captures how much you can adjust, how much cash you return to stockholders as your net income changes. If you're a company with high cash return flexibility, here's what you do. If your net income implodes, your cash free cash flows drop off to equity, you cut back on cash return or you stop returning cash. If you're a company with low cash return flexibility, you're kind of stuck. You've got to keep returning cash even if your cash flows to equity turn negative. And what drives this flexibility? First, the choice you make about how much cash you return to your stockholders. Companies that return a high percentage of their net income of free cash flow equity stockholders have less flexibility than companies that return a low percentage. And among those companies that return a high percentage, those companies that pay dividends have less flexibility than companies that buy back stock. And this is a simple reason for that. Once you start paying dividends, they become sticky. What that means is you, it becomes difficult for you to change dividends. Buybacks, on the other hand, if you don't have the capacity to return the cash, you just stop. So to measure cash return flexibility, I first looked at dividend yields by companies. Because outside of the U.S., many companies don't buy back stock. Dividends tend to be the standard way in which companies return cash. And I looked at dividend yield. Dividends is a person of market cap. And you can already see that non-dividend paying companies or low dividend yield companies have done a lot better than companies that return a lot of their, lot of their cash flows as dividends. Now, that's just dividends. You're saying, what about buybacks? They must be worse, right? To examine whether dividends were better or worse than buybacks when it comes to cash return in terms of flexibility. Here's what I did. I divided all global companies into four groups based on whether they paid dividends and whether they bought back stock. So companies, so there are some companies that do both dividends and buybacks and they did the worst among all of the companies that I tracked. So if companies did both dividends and buybacks. See the green, green part, green column that tells you the returns over the entire time period, most negative. At the other extreme are companies that pay neither dividends nor buy back stock. They return no cash. They did the best. So they basically are, have broken even by now. But look at companies that pay only dividends or buy back only stock. So this is a more direct comparison. And if you look at companies that paid, that either paid dividends or bought back stock but didn't do the other, companies that paid dividends did worse than buybacks. It's not conclusive proof of anything. But those people going around arguing that buybacks are a worse way of returning cash than dividends, you've got some work to do because at least so far the data is not backing you up. So financing flexibility overall seems to be a winner in this crisis. And it's not just this crisis. Over the last decade, companies have built more flexible business models. I talked about disruptors like Uber and Airbnb. And what they shared in common is a scaling up model, a model where they could scale up quickly. And they also built business models with a lot more flexibility. And people are pushing flexibility on companies. So I've seen consultants and uh, CFOs and CEOs argue that their company should become more agile, more flexible. That's good. But remember, like everything else in business, there's a trade-off. As companies push for more flexibility, especially on the investment front, here's what's happening. They're able to scale up faster, but they're also building up business models that are more difficult to defend. Why? Because the same forces that allow them to scale up allow their competitors to also scale up. Scale up. So they're getting business models where they can get big really quickly, but these are business models where they find it difficult to make money and difficult to stay on top for very long. It's an argument I've made about scaling up models where you're, you're finding it difficult to make money. You can say that about Uber and Airbnb. They've scaled up really well, but they haven't figured out how to make money. So I've made this argument that as companies build these in models which are flexible on investment front, they're also building models where the corporate life cycle is getting compressed. So unlike the companies of the 20th century, where companies lasted 100, 125 years, successful ones, the successful companies of the 21st century might last only 20 to 25 years. And that has huge implications for investing, for management, for corporate finance. It is also, there's also a trade-off on operating and financing flexibility. The same forces that give you a buffer on the downside. So building more operating and financing flexibility makes the downside more manageable for you. But it also means you're going to give up something on the upside. I'm not saying this is good or bad, but that trade-off has to be factored in is you're going to lose something on the upside. 
And finally, there's something that I think we need to talk about openly. As companies build up these flexible models, some of the costs are being passed on to society. I don't mean to mean to pick on Uber, but one of the things Uber did that gave them a more flexible operating model was they treated their drivers as independent contractors. That reduced their, that made their cost structure more flexible. But in the process, they've also passed on the cost of providing health care and pensions, a safety net to society. I'm not saying this is good or bad. Maybe the way to the future is building more flexible business models. But we also have to then talk about who's going to bear these social costs. Because otherwise, we as taxpayers ultimately will bear these costs. But those who argue that flexibility is an unalloyed good might be missing the dark side of flexibility. Something to think about and something we need to be talking about much more in the future. But thank you for letting me share. And I hope to see you again.